stories come from many sources and they often take us to far-flung places. I love it that one of my favorite stories started in a wood-paneled library and dispatched me on my most challenging adventure, one that changed me almost as much as it changed my book. I was in the New York Yacht Club library in 1996 when I looked up on a shelf and saw on the spine of a book the words sufferings in Africa. I pulled it down and started to read. It was the true story of the 1815 shipwreck of the Connecticut merchant brig Commerce. While sailing from the Mediterranean to the Canary Islands to pick up salt, Captain James Riley and his crew of 11 men lost their way in a fog, a dense fog, and crashed on the coast of Africa. They were captured by Arab nomads and enslaved. Riley, whose memoir I was reading, and half of his crew would eventually escape and go 800 miles across the desert to freedom. I knew I discovered a lost gem of American history, but what convinced me that it needed to be retold for a modern audience was that in this clash of West and East, to survive, Riley hadn't used force, but he had forged a friendship with an Arab caravan trader named C.D. Hammett, who would help him get to safety. To retell this story the way it deserved to be told, I knew I needed to go to Western Sahara and retrace Riley's route. It just so happened that after planning this expedition for a year, it fell the week after 9-11. I landed in Western Sahara the day the U.S. began bombing Afghanistan. My trip was a disaster from the start. Western Sahara is a highly landmined, disputed territory controlled by the Moroccan military who in the wake of 9-11 were very nervous and didn't want me there. They, for a week, they wouldn't let me go inland on Riley's Trail. And finally, they forced me to go north of the Moroccan border to get started. I was beginning to despair of getting anything at all useful for my, uh, for my research when all of a sudden everything changed. It was our first day on camels. That's me, by the way, between two of the, 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 the mighty beasts. Our guide, Muhammad El Arab, was a camel jockey instructor from Marrakesh. Born on the desert, he learned to ride a camel the way you and I learned to ride a bike. He gets on his camel, takes a cudgel, whacks it, and goes tearing off across the desert. My camel goes flying after his camel. My metaphor for riding on a camel is it's like sitting on a bar stool on a horse. <laughs> the horse goes one way, the bar stool goes the other. I'm hanging on for dear life, dodging rafts of foam that are flying out of my camel's mouth. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I feel myself sliding sideways. <laughs> they haven't cinched my saddle on tightly enough. Pretty soon, I'm looking at the camel's whip-sawing legs, and I'm getting ready to go into them, and I realize I've got to bail out. I let go of the reins, fall to the ground, hit it hard. Muhammad finally realizes I'm not behind him anymore. He comes riding up and he looks down at me and goes, King, what's wrong with you? And I'm checking my head and my ribs to see if anything's cracked or broken. I don't respond. Muhammad says, never mind. Camels are sacred beasts. Those who fall from them are protected by God. <laughs> okay. Well, this was small solace for a Westerner who doesn't necessarily believe in the holy nature of camels. However, inside I had a great big grin because I'd heard these words before. In 1815, when Riley fell off his camel, his guide had said very nearly the same thing to him. This was a revelation to me in more ways than one. First, it was like a wrinkle in time crossing two centuries connecting me to my subject, Riley, in a way that I never could have imagined before it happened. Second, while I'd gone there to <clears throat> get the, the hard data of Riley's journey, to go to the, the wells he had crossed, to go to the, 
to the, to the wadis, uh, the dry riverbeds that he had had to, to manage. And that had all been disrupted by the Moroccan military. Now I sense that maybe there was something much greater to be gotten from this journey. I started to see shades of Riley's guide, Sidi Hammett, and my guide, Muhammad. Muhammad was a natural born teacher, it turned out. When we crossed paths on our camels, he would in, look at me and in the age old custom of the desert, he'd go, chief of the Ulid Busba, that was the tribe that had captured Riley, do you have sugar? Do you have salt? Are there enemies ahead? And he taught me about camels. On the desert, Arabs measure their wealth in camels. Camels give them nutrition, rich milk, uh, transportation, hair that they use in clothes and tents, their shelter. And when I asked Muhammad if they still drink camel urine on the desert the way Riley had to do to survive, he didn't bat an eye. Yeah, sure, we drink camel urine. We drink the urine of a pregnant camel for mouth sores and stomach ailments. <laughs> Muhammad taught me the old Arab proverb that only those who ride camels know camels. At night, we would sit out on a carpet by a lantern in our open air tent, gazing out at the stars and discussing Riley's journey. Muhammad would look at the maps of the places I hadn't been able to go and say, oh yes, he would have gone there, that's an Ulud Busbo well, or they would have crossed the wadi there, there's a, there's a passage through there. <clears throat> Even more important than what he was telling me though was the way in which I was learning it. You see, Muhammad speaks only Arabic and Spanish, and I speak English and French. We had to cobble together a language, repeating ourselves and gesturing. Riley had had to do the same thing when he was there. He was in his master's camp one day, and an Arab trader rode in, it was C.D. Hammett, and he knew it was his last best chance to get off the desert. He had to convince this guy to buy him and his men and to, to take them north across the desert to be ransomed. He didn't speak his language. Somehow he managed to do it, and now I knew how. Muhammad wasn't just our camel riding coach, he was also our local guide. On the Sahara, the terrain is constantly shifting, the people are moving, there are no fixed dwellings, and the maps are all inaccurate. So you have to have a local guide. Well, one day, we got off our route a little bit, and uh, <clears throat> we'd gotten out of Muhammad's area of expertise. And he comes to me and says, King, you like me, right? I said, yes, Muhammad, I'm learning so much fr from you. You're one of the saving graces of this trip. He said, well, you better tell the head man he's gonna fire me. I went to the head man, I said, you've got to keep Muhammad, I'm learning so much from him. Next day, he fired him. This was a, a harsh lesson for me in the economies of the desert. We had six camels. If you couldn't do your job, you didn't have a seat on your camel. I was left now with our camel wrangler, Ali. Every morning, Ali fed and watered our camels and saddled them. And whenever we came to a well on the desert, Ali would find the hidden bucket. Sometimes that even meant that he had to shimmy down the well shaft and fish it out of the water in the bottom. Ali and I hadn't gotten off to a great start. I'd gone to the Sahara to do what Riley said he and his men had done, to go 50 and 100 mile days riding those camels until it hurt so much that you got off and ran and then getting back on the camels and riding some more. So far we'd managed to go about 30 miles a day. I was, I was not happy. I was telling our guys, we gotta go further, we gotta go faster constantly. Frankly, I was making everybody pretty miserable. Ollie got frustrated with me, and he challenges me to a foot race. We go running off across the desert, most of which isn't those beautiful sandy dunes you see in photographs, but more like this. Hard pan, pocked with cannonball-sized stones. We could have broken our ankles. I had trained five and 10 mile, uh, 10 miles at a time running before I'd gone there. Pretty soon I was well out in front of Ali. And then I realized, what now? It doesn't do you much good to be able to beat your guide in a foot race on the desert. <laughs> that, 
that's when I knew that I had to change my leadership style. <laughs> the plans that I'd made back here, I had to adapt to the realities of the Sahara. Riley had had a similar experience. After he got captured, he and his men were stripped naked. They were forced to drink water out of the camel's troughs. <clears throat> he was broken. He says, I searched for a stone to bash my own brains in with. He got through that moment, he didn't find that stone, but he was also transformed. He realized that he had to surrender to the will of God, and he became a different kind of leader. He became a shepherd to his men and helped guide them across the desert. This brings me to my favorite moment of the journey. The day before Muhammad left, we were sitting around a well uh, after lunch, and a camel snorts. Out from its nostril shoots a small creature onto the sand. <laughs> Muhammad looks at it and goes, doodah. A doodah is a parasite that grows in a camel's nostril until it gets so big that it blocks the air passage and the camel ejects it. It looks like a pearl onion with legs. <laughs> Dust. Well, Duda, song came to my mind and I started to sing. You can probably guess what it was. <laughs> Camp Town ladies sing this song, Duda, Duda. Muhammad thinks that's funny. He starts singing along with me. <laughs> Camp Town racetracks five miles long, oh de doo da day. Well, pretty soon we were laughing and belting it out, having a grand old time. And later I, I realized what an amazing moment this was. The word that meant something to Muhammad, duda, meant nothing to me. And the words that meant something to me meant nothing to Muhammad. Yet it united us in this expression of joy and camaraderie and, and friendship that I'll never forget. As we rode across the desert, as we suffered together on the camels, as we sang together, laughed together, as Muhammad put my shesh on in the morning, we managed to bridge the gulf in our cultures and our religions and become friends, just the way Riley had done with City Hammett in 1815. What I learned on this journey is that research is about much more than just gathering facts. It's about, it's about reaching a new level of understanding and maybe even changing. For me, it's, it was about becoming the writer who deserved to tell the story. And along the way, we just might find that the most important things that we learn are not of the head, but of the heart. Remember, only riders of camels know camels. Thank you.